In this last example, we again have a unit feedback loop, and this is the characteristic equation of the closed loop transfer function. Let's write Let's draw the root locus for k as k varies from 0 to infinity. This system has three poles and no zeros, so n minus m equals to 3. When n minus m equals to 3, you have an excess of three poles. They go to infinity following asymptotes, and the angles of those asymptotes are 60, negative 60, and 180 degrees. And the poles are s equals to 0 and s equals to negative 1 plus minus 2j. Now let's look for breakaway or breaking point. To do that, we set k equals to p of s, isolate for p of s in this expression, that it gives negative s times s squared plus 2s plus 5. Taking the derivative of p of s with respect to s gives s to the power of 3, 3s squared, 2s squared is 4s, plus 5s, that becomes 5. We now equate this to 0 and solve for the values of s. s will be, here a second order equation, negative 0 0.667 plus minus 1.1 j. This is a complex number. We can conclude that there is no breakaway or breaking point. And let's write down this information. No breakaway or breaking point. Now let's look for the maximum value of k before the system becomes unstable. To do that, we can use the route Hurwitz stability criterion. Finding a common denominator here and rearranging this, expre this expression will give s to the power of 3 plus 2s squared plus 5s plus k equals to zero. This is the characteristic equation in another form. It's the same equation that you have here. We can now proceed with the route Hurwitz array. So that's start, that starts at the power of three, two, one, and zero. And the coefficients of s's here are one, two, five, and k. Now we can do a cross multiplication here to find the value of this element. This will be k minus 10 divided by negative 2. The value here is 0. The value here will be k, and here we have 0. So if k is 0, we have a row of zeros, and if k is 10, we have another row of zeros here. This now characterizes the maximum gain before the system becomes unstable. Anything greater than 10 will give us a negative value here, and we have one sign change, two unstable roots. So k equals to 10 is the maximum value of k before instability. And let's write that down as well. k max is 10. Now let's place the poles on the s-plane. The first one is at 0, and the other two are at negative 1, plus minus 2j, which is around here, negative 6, 0 0.667. One of the asymptotes now goes up at an angle of 60, the other one goes down at negative 60, and the third one goes to negative infinity with an angle of 180 degrees. Where is the root locus? Now the root locus is to the left of a number of real poles and zeros. This is the only one, so this part of the s-plane is the only one with an odd count. And because you have an asymptote going at negative 180 degrees, we can conclude that this pole needs to follow that asymptote and go to negative infinity. So this pole is the one that travels to negative infinity. And it uses the 180 degree asymptote. What happens to these two? Well, they need to go to the asymptotes. 
we concluded that there is no breakaway or breaking point. So they will never touch the, the real axis. They would simply go to the asymptotes. At which angle would they go to the asymptotes? What is the departure angle? To calculate the departure angle, let's take a reference point right here. And let's assume that that reference point is very close to this pole that I'm going to call here P1. Let's call this one P2. This point, called that R, is very close to P1. Now let's define all the angles with respect to that uh, reference dot there. The first one is here. I'm going to call this angle theta1. Actually, let's call that alpha1 to avoid confusion with our theta1 from here. Alpha1. This angle here from this pole, we can call that alpha 2, but because this point is very close to P1 and they are both at negative 1, this is 90 degrees. And the third angle is the angle between P1 and the reference point. Let's call that angle alpha 2. What is alpha 1? Alpha 1 you can calculate using simple trigonometry. Alpha 1 is 180 minus the arctangent of 2 over 1. And alpha 1 should then give 116 degrees approximately. This angle is 116 degrees. The one you want to determine is alpha 2, which is the departure angle of P1. Now, if this point here that we assume to be a reference point belongs to the root locus, then the sum of all angles with respect to this point needs to add up to 180 degrees. That's how we derive the theorem that we use to calculate the departure angle. And that's one requirement for a point to be part of the root locus. If the sum of all angles that at this point forms with all other poles and zeros is not 180 degrees, then it's not part of the root locus. Which means that alpha 2 plus alpha 1 plus 90 degrees needs to equate to 180 degrees. Because this point again is part of the root locus. Now we can solve for alpha 2. That is 180 minus 90 degrees minus alpha 1 minus 116 degrees. And this gives alpha 2 as negative 26 degrees. This is the departure angle of P1. If P1 departs at a negative 26 degree, then P2 goes up at a 26 degrees because remember, the root locus needs to be symmetric with respect to the real axis. Now this pole goes down at a 25, 26 degrees and then goes along the asymptote like that. And this angle here is negative 26 degrees. The other pole here goes up at a 26 degrees and then joins the asymptote. So it goes up and then down. And here we have this beautiful root locus. The value of k at this point here is k equals to 10. So if k is between 0 and 10, the system is underdamped because of the presence of this complex conjugate poles. Even though we have a real pole here, the complex conjugate poles are enough to characterize an underdamped system. When k equals to 10, then the poles will lie here, and the system is critically stable or marginally stable. Past that, k greater than 10 gives an unstable system.